732. This is uh, Laws uh, 12065, Foundations of Property Law. And uh, tonight's tutorial is uh, covering the topic, topic 10, which is changes to property. And we'll also be uh, dealing with uh, tutorial, tutorial problems 21 and 22 in topic 10. Right, so that's that. Got that out of the way. Um, yeah, look, I, I mean, I'm. It, I. It's hard to know when you're running an extra class like this. Um, when's the best time? But for me, it was important to to cover the substantive topics before or by the end of week twelve. I certainly didn't want <clears throat> that running over into week thirteen, given the timing of the uh, the final exam. And um, so then, I, then I'm trying to juggle the time because I share a Zoom license with Chris, Chris Walshaw, who um, he's running, uh, I think, commercial uh, principles commercial law. I mean, a number of factors here, and of course, everyone's you know fully maxed out at this time of the year anyway. I appreciate that in a whole range of ways. Um, so really, you know, that's how I can. And of course, I've got a whole lot of things going on myself, including going off to a conference on Friday afternoon. Um, so the uh, just just settled upon this time really but the benefit of course is that the the, the sessions recorded and then anyone in the course can can view the session subsequently and of course following the exam advice um, uh, this topic is examinable uh, on the final and uh, as I've indicated in that advice uh, it will contain a mixture of essay style and problem solving questions but as you see, there are required problem solving questions. And uh, it's really a matter for students to work out which topics lend themselves more to uh, problem solving scenarios as opposed to you know, more discursive type, uh, type questions. Um, have you got any questions before we, we sort of launch into the topic? Any issues? Um, no, nothing. Nothing jumps out. This was a, an interesting topic. Um, week yeah. ten. Yeah. Um, I. I guess fixtures. Um, fixtures mm. versus chattel is always something that mm. sometimes uh, the lines are a bit hazy. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Mm. There's a the the, te the annexation test um, helps. Mm. 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 Absolutely. The the. Um also, the other interesting thing I just just note in passing, um, I was surprised that uh, look and again I appreciate people under, under stress and stuff at this time with regard to a whole range of things, but not a single post to the questions <laughs> for this week um, on on Moodle, which was a bit surprising. Um, I noticed that you've already posted a response to the question for week topic eleven, yes, um, which. Uh, it's great, excellent. Um, I just had a quick look through it. Um, haven't had a detailed look through it yet, but uh, you know, I, that's the other thing too. Week the week eleven topic. Um, that's an that's an innovation. Another yet another one, I suppose you could say for by me. Um, it's very relevant. Though. Oh well, I mean, I you know, absolutely, absolutely. But I think a lot of conventional property law programs are not incorporating that necessarily into their suite of topics. Um, I think sometimes it's being deferred to maybe a commercial law course or is it, uh, I'm sure it's covered in some way. I mean, so some larger some larger law schools may actually have a whole course on it. Well, fair enough. Um, but I actually think, look, it, it is an important area. It's a new area. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that on Friday. But... Uh, you know, I mean, we've looked at personal property and I raised, when we looked at that in topic four, the competing policy imperatives. And guess what? One of those imperatives is the security of interests. Mm. And guess how that is now dealt with in Australia? It's dealt with through the PPSA. So in my view, if we exclude it, um, it's, you know, I'm, I think it's a bit um, uh, inappropriate. I think it needs to be there. But... Having said that, it's a complicated area, and what we do and what we can do in the in the in the space that we have is is uh, introductory, I suppose. But I've tried to lay out the framework and and the basis 
of the system by by looking at the key concepts and providing an understanding of that. Anyway, that will be dealt with um, on in Friday's class. All right. So this topic ten, uh, you know, basically, it's interesting. You know, the the title of the topic, and it's fairly evident for anyone that's you know that's read the um, the case book that I've just taken the title from the chapter in um, the chapter 16 in, in the case book. But I, I thought it was an appropriate title because it's effectively what is actually happening through these themes that, that we're looking at. And, you know, there is essentially three themes here. One is, as you've correctly identified, Samuel, firstly, is the very important um, doctrine of fixtures. Um, some books refer to that as the law of fixtures. It's neither here nor there as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's not actually an entire body of law <laughs> in its own right. Um, I think the doctrine maybe is, is it's fair enough. I, I'm happy to, to refer to it like that, and I've done so. Um, so that's the first major theme. Um, the second one is in relation to how do we deal with claims in relation to airspace um, and what are those claims? Um, as you will have discovered through uh, your reading, that uh, historically, um, going back several centuries, uh, there was an idea that the claim the claim could be made virtually from the sur soil surface to the heavens, wh wherever that point ends, depending on what might you know what what worldview you hold, um, which is was a bit uh, a bit of an outrageous claim. But the point is, what what sort of control or what sort of claim can a land owner have over airspace above the, the surface of the soil of the land area that they actually have a claim to, right? And uh, we've already seen that the nature of that landowner's claim um, is actually really not absolute ownership anyway, but it's actually to... Uh, a rights with respect to a period of time, even if you know a fee simple interest, as we know today, um, equates almost to, to complete ownership. But it is still only a time um, uh, category of of defining the rights that the landowner has. So that's the second major theme with regard to airspace. So that which is above the surface of the of the soil or the land, if you like. And then the third major theme is the one, well, what, you know, not ab only above, but what about, what about going under the, underneath, going, going to the subsoil? And, um, of course, the, the idea then is, well, what, how far do we go? We talk, go right down to the centre of, of the planet. Is that, is that what we're talking about? Well, that would be a total nonsense as well. Um, and then, of course, we've got the other issue with regard to subsoil, that we're not just talking about earth, not just talking about oil, uh, sorry, <laughs> hardly giving it away. They're not just talking about soil, but what actually is contained within the soil. And we know, of course, that in the subsoil, we find mineral deposits um, of different kinds. They can be solid deposits, they can be liquid deposits, or they can be gaseous deposits. And these things can be very valuable, as we, we know. Um, you know, all of our energy basically, you know, for, for the last 100 years, um, maybe not 100 years, but sort of thereabouts, um, has been based on the use of these fossil fuels, which are basically from deposits in the subsoil. So um, issues about who owns that, who can get access to that, who controls that, uh, is a part of that, that theme with regard to what's in the subsoil. So that's the, the parameters of what we're looking at in tonight's topic 10. Um, so we might um, just, in our normal way, proceed to the tutorial problems, which will help us to go back and um, dig into um, the, the, the structure of those themes. So we've got um, problem 21. Um, now, problem. Have you had a look at problem twenty-one, Samuel? I, <clears throat> to be honest with you, I've skimmed at it, but yes. I'm, I've got some some rough that's, some rough notes which I'm going to have a look at. Right, now. that's I'm fine. Sure. That's fine. No, no, no worries with that. Um, we'll just. I, try, I tried to read the the cases. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a little bit. That's excellent. I mean, that's the that's the strategy, and it's, 
it was actually good to hear your comment. I think you either said it in a tutorial or sent me an email that after we, we, we had a chat early in the course, you, mm. you readjusted how you were doing things and that you yeah. found that readjustment real, or realignment to, to actually make things much better and, and also much more interesting for you. So I thought that was really um, yeah, quite, quite, quite helpful to, to say that. Uh, so basically, problem 21, is, you know, as indicated there, is, is really about the doctrine of fixtures. If we, you know, it's fairly, it's a, you know, it's, there's several questions really within that. Um, we can break up the various aspects of it, uh, in my view, to like in the following way. The first one is the first aspect of the question or part of the question is focusing on, well, what was the original function of the doctrine of fixtures? In other words, why, why, was, why, did, the, why did the common law, and of course we're talking about something here that's recognised through the common law, through case law, uh, and, and it's common law, not, not equity, it's common law that looks at this. Um, why was it identified historically? And that's actually, you know, that links a bit into the last part of the question too. And of course, you know that many of my questions or the way I'm st I structure things are ambulatory like this in the sense that they're trying to get you to think about the historical rationale, but then to cite that uh, understanding within the modern period to say, well, does, therefore, we have this concept emerge in the law out of a particular set of circumstances, as is the, the normal way, uh, out of a particular set of social conditions or whatever at a point in history, is, it, is that concept still of continuing relevance today and how is it being applied? Because what we'll actually, I think, discover, I suspect, is that the historical rationale for the development of the doctrine is somewhat different to how it's applied today and the reason why it has continuing application today. So the first aspect of the question is looking at that. The next one, next aspect, you know, takes you into a bit of a situation where it's asking, well, you know, what about materials that have been used to construct a dwelling? Um, you know, do, do they retain the character of personality? Uh, in other words, personal property or uh, are this, you know, how, how, how is it that they, they become maybe a part of the land or a part of the dwelling which is incorporated in the land um, or how do they, how do they continue to, to maintain their characteristics as items of personal property? So that's, I'd say, the second part. Um, and then, you know, the next bit of the question is really linking back to that his, history again in terms of what was the purpose? Was it to, um, to uh, basically about the conservation of community resources? Uh, and that's very that's a very interesting insight when you think of the 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 Palumbri case in terms of the, the fight between the two brothers <laughs> over everything from 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 Venetian blinds um, to, <laughs> to curtains and and whatever um, and that's I think an interesting example of of how the fixtures doctrine of fixtures gets practically applied today that in the end today actually often has very little to do with this idea of conserving community resources. It's about um, fights over personal property and who gets what and, and what and so on and so forth. Um, and that history is also the next little bit there linking back to the preventing of the wasteful process of dismantling objects affixed to land. Um, and, uh, and then getting to your point that you've referred to, uh, Samuel, very importantly, that, uh, the, the annexation test, both in terms of the degree of annexation and the purpose of annexation. We see through the case law that there's been these two aspects of annexation um, and, and uh, we'll get a chance to look at that. And then the last bit is just again asking, well, its application uh, in, in the modern period today. Um, so do you want to have a bit of a stab any of that or? Sure. Um, <clears throat> let me just go to it. So from my reading of the notes and very, very basic understanding, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. the original function of the doctrine of fixtures was to differentiate between competing interests between mm. a fixture and chattel, as I understood. 
So what was what was chattel and what was a fixture? So it was a bit more defined. And in looking at that, I then turned to how would the doctrine govern a situation where materials used to construct the dwelling retain their character as personality? Um, I fall back on my engineering in that context. Mm. And I say, for example, if if there's a a wonderful sandstone heritage um, sculpture in 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 a garden, is that a fixture to to an estate or a property uh, or land, or is it chattel? Mm. I think about how is that sculpture, which is heritage listed or, you know, it's, it's got that unique characteristic. How is that fixed to the land? Mm. Is it, uh, does, it have, um, does it have concrete footings to hold it up? Does it have some sort of reinforcement to keep it in place to avoid wind loading? Mm. Is it resting on its own weight? Mm. Um, does it matter? Does it? I'm going to. I want to ask you a few questions in relation to that because that's a very nice example you've provided. Um, does it? Do, I mean, you're focusing on the, if I can explain it like this, the the physical characteristics of annexation. Mm-hmm. Fear, and that's fear, and that's an aspect. Um, what about the intention of the party or the person that affixed in the first place? Do we need to think about that? Um, y- yes, we do. Uh, because I think the intention is important because if you take it to a, something that's not so fancy as a, a, a sandstone or a heritage sculpture, mm. and we talk about a kid's sandbox in yeah. a backyard mm. or a piggy or a, a cubby house, mm. That's not intended to be a permanent fixture. That is there for the enjoyment of the user while they're there. Yeah. So I think. And are we talking here when we when we when we when we're investigating intention? Whose intention are we focusing on? We're focusing on the. We're focusing on the, the the primary. Uh, landowner's intention or the, the primary user's intent. Like if it's my house, it's my, my intention. What did I intend when I put it there? The owner, let's, the, let's, owner of the, the owner of the, of the chattel. The person that has, let's be more specific, the, the person or the party who has affixed, if you like, okay. or has, has uh, brought this item of personal, personality or personal property onto the land Right, and let's 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 continue on for a little bit with your example. I want to use a few others, but um, let's continue on with yours. So we've got this sandstone. Uh, just say what what is it? It's, let's just call it a fountain. Okay, let's call it fountain. a fountain. Okay, so it's a sandstone fountain, um, and it's. Uh, do, do you want it to be heritage listed? It's it's up to you. <laughs> we, can, okay. we can we can we can hear it to you. You want it to have nice uh, nice sculpting and this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's an artistic piece, is it? It's it's it, it, it's a it's eighty years old. Eighty years old. Okay, that's nice. And uh, um, is it is it a, is it a substantial substantial piece? I mean, yeah. both in terms of size and weight and it's and girth. And girth, absolutely. Girth. I was getting to girth. Thank you for You're that. To, yeah. <laughs> There's your engineering coming through. <laughs> so we're talking about some substantial item that um, has been placed on the land and clearly from, from the detail and the specifics that we've now agreed upon, it's obviously something not easily moved about. You know, every day you're not going to decide, oh, I'll move to this part and move to this part. Once it's there, it's there basically in a sense, That's isn't correct. it? Yeah. Yes. But the question is, when we talk about once it's there, it's there, is it important to, th- to reflect upon the intention of the person or the, the party or the entity that brought it there in terms of how long they wanted it to be there? Is that an important, important question to ask? I'd, I'd say so because something like, something like that or something of significance like that would have been in the planning of what the property or the amenity of the property. I mean, it's it, good. Yep. It, it, it is part of the character of the property. It is how mm. you enjoy the property. Good. Without it, some mm. of the characteristics would, would not be there. And the, uh, all these all these words that you're using, all good, all good. All so good. that's great. We're, we're recording this session. Aren't we? <laughs> we are recording this session, sir. 
So ish, words, words like, or descriptors like amenity, character, utility. I mean, these are all good descriptors in terms of trying to explain whether this item has the role of being a part of the land, a fixture, rather than remaining an item of personal property. We've, we've looked at, and we'll, we'll go back to the case law shortly, but mm. we, we, we've looked at um, the, the intention of, of the person or the entity bringing it on. Is that to be objectively or subjectively determined? I think objectively. All right. We had, we, I, don't know, I don't know whether you were with us, I think, in the last class, but we had a bit of a, a backwards and a forwards. Um, particularly, I think Grant raised the issue about the objective and subjective. And, and if you go back and have a look at the recording um, to the last class, there'll be a discussion, a fairly robust <laughs> discussion about that. Not, not with regard to how we're talking about it now, but just that in law, of course, there is always a desire to, to determine things objectively. But in some circumstances, there is a subjective underlay to that as well. That, and there's a subtle relationship sometimes, mm. if not often, between the objective and the subjective. And it's just something to bear in mind. But in this case, we're trying as best we can to objectively determine what is the intention of that person bringing this item onto the land and, and it was intended for long. Is, is the... Is the intention with respect to the period of permanency or the period or the duration is that is that determinative determinative of itself in terms of so in other words if we say it's intended that the person bring it on there intended to be there for a long period of time which we can't really work out the end of if we get a tick next to that does that mean it's a fixture? Um. It, more than likely, it's a it's a fixture, because it's like saying that I want to move a retaining wall off a property, because mm. it's it's a it's a certain type of of, uh, of stone or brick that that I've enjoyed or that I liked at the time, but now I want to move it. No, it's it's there for a purpose. It's serving. It has a function that is directly annexed or connected to the the land itself. So be careful, be careful now. You're saying it right? is annexed. That's the thing that we're trying to discover. So we okay. can't well, draw that okay. conclusion okay. yet. Okay. I'm saying an annexed in a constructive. Uh, I know that. I know that. But because so that's... I'll use a different term. Yes, please. Mm. It's, um, it's, 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 okay. It's intention or it's use it has a, an obvious permanent function connected with the land. Oh, that's, that's useful, yeah. And also, another word that could be used is the idea of attachment. Attached. How is it attached? Okay. Now, the other point to note, and if we, we can actually go back to some case law at this point, and if you've got your notes open, um, if you go back to, um, of course, um, well, you know, the, those two cases, the Blacker case, which is um, a 2000 decision of the Federal Court on the one hand, citing the earlier decision of Australian Provincial Assurance in Coronio, which is a 1938 New South Wales Court decision, and actually a leading authority in terms of this area of understanding the nature of the doctrine of fixtures. Mm. And then subsequently, or you know, before that actually, another New South Wales Court decision, um, equity division of Palumbri mm. and Palumbri. Now, if we go back to Blacker's case, and in particular the, the reference to Coronio, so if we look at the, the quotation there from Coronio's case, um, to remain in position permanently or for an indefinite or substantial period, right, mm. is a factor. Um, or in contrast to that, or for some temporary purpose. So that can also be something that we are concerned about. So the, the intention with respect to duration is important, but it is not the only factor and it does not answer the question of itself in terms of whether this item is a fiction. A bit further down that quotation, the bit that I've highlighted uh, or I've underlined, the intention of the person fixing it must be gathered from the purpose for which 
and the time during which the user in the fixed position contemplated. So it is the contemplation of the person fixing and it is the intention of the person fixing that we're focusing on. Okay, but notice the last sentence, but each case depends on its own facts. Now you might say, oh yes, well, that's nothing, nothing uh, terribly controversial there. Judges always say it depends on the facts at the end of the day. But in this area, probably more so than in some other areas, it is the case that the, 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 the nature of the facts and the circumstances of the case are very critical to decide whether the tests have been satisfied. So let's go back to your example again. We've got the uh, fountain. I think the fountain, is that right? Yep, We've yep. Got fountain. 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 It's got, um, it's, it's artistic. Uh, in your words, it adds to the amenity, to the utility, to the character of the, of the land in some way. It's heavy. I think you've said it's a heavy item. Mm -hmm. So not easy to move. I mean, is that an important factor? The fact that it's seeing like its weight is is making it difficult. Is that important? Is that a how do we deal with that? Yeah, but I, I think it's important because it helps us consider whether it's something that. I mean, it's not a patio chair. It's, it's not, not something patio. that can be. It's not something that can be picked up and moved around and thrown in the back of the car and driven off with. It's it's there. It is it is a semi permanent structure. So would it make a difference? If, for example, the fountain was sitting there secured only by its own weight, and let's just make the assumption, but it's, you know, it, it flows from, from what you've said in terms of this example, that it's a substantial and fairly heavy item and it's not going to be moved around or blown around or whatever. So is it make a difference if it's just sitting there by its own weight or, for example, if it's, and just excuse me, my engineering understanding is not oh, okay. yours, but if it's sort of recessed into a concrete platform and secured into a recessed concrete seating in the ground, would that make a difference? Not really, because the purpose is still the same behind it, isn't it? The purpose is still to add amenity and enjoyment and utility to the land. It's not the way it's, the way it's attached is... I guess it's a, it's it's a somewhat important factor, but it's probably not. It's probably a means to an end. It's probably just the means of how we got it there, so we can enjoy it. Let me ask you this question: When you talk about use and amenity, mm -hmm. is the fountain? If it, let's assume for a moment that it is in the former situation, that is, it's not actually recessed into concrete. Okay, just sitting by its own weight. Could mm -hmm. it be argued that the fountain is there to assist the amenity and the use by the current owner, given how the current owner of the land likes to enjoy the property, but that when that owner ceases to be the owner, the owner intends to take it away with him or her because it's only related to their particular use or amenity rather than the general character and amenity of the land as such. Yep, that's possible. Because can we draw those sort of distinctions? We can. We can based on the NAB and Blacker case um, yeah. because it, it does talk about, well, the, la the, last, the last sentence says each case depends on its own facts and, and in, in this case the facts are that the owner enjoyed it for a particular purpose and he wants to take it with him when he ceases to be the owner. And notice so, too that in Blacker the, the judge, uh, Conti, was identifying, as we've done already, the idea of the degree of annexation and the object of annexation. And further down in his judgment, uh, and I'm looking at pages nine and ten of the notes here, under yeah. purpose of annexation, and this is a, I've taken this directly from the judgment, in determining the purpose or the object of annexation, a variety of considerations may be taken into account by the court, such as whether the attachment was for the better enjoyment of the property generally or for the better enjoyment of the land, the nature of the property, the subject of affixation, whether the item was in a position either permanently or temporarily. Notice all of these are factors to be considered. Yes. No one factor is determinative of itself, right? And, and we look at the whole fact situation. The function to be served by annexation, all right? What if, for example, using your example, your um, the example you've given, that the owner of the land was actually um, a, a, a bird enthusiast? And, and this was a fountain to attract birds. 
um, that if we knew that, that might be a fa some factor to indicate that this is more in relation to this owner's use rather than the general character of the land as such, for example, hypothetically. And then degree of annexation, right? Some things, you know, things we can look at, whether the removal would cause damage to the land. My uh, elaboration of your example, of course, if it's cemented into the ground, removing it would cause damage. Whereas yes. if it's sitting by its own weight, not easy to remove, but, you know, bring a crane in and take yeah. it away. And it can be done. It might have a bit of an indentation <laughs> where it was sitting, but mm. no more than that. The mode and the structure of annexation, by what methods, um, whether removal would destroy or damage the attached item, and whether the cost of renewal would exceed the value of the attached property. Now, you raised earlier in your example heritage listing. Okay. Again, if we have information about that, of course, that will bear upon the value of the land because if you've got something there that links to that, it can make the, the, the whole of the land more valuable because it might have heritage listed items or whatever. On the other hand as well, it could create further burdens because it makes it more difficult to actually do things to the land sometimes. Maybe this, <laughs> this fountain cannot be touched and nothing can happen within a certain perimeter of it. And that may mean that the subsequent owner, who maybe, like a lot of owners today, wants to come in and bulldoze everything and build a block of flats because that's what helps make more money, uh, mm. <laughs> yeah, can't do it, right? So, um, you know, there are those sort of factors as well. If we go to the Palumbri case, that I think helps us to um, use, a, use a different type of example. So you've used an example which is outside. Let's, let's move to possible examples inside a dwelling, right? What were some of the items that were in dispute between the brothers in Palumbri? Um, wasn't I it need the... to refer back to the case. I didn't actually list them all in the notes because they were yeah, no. too extensive, but um, they're, fairly, they're fairly typical and generic. Yeah, I'm just opening up the, uh, my notes on it. Um, they were mostly all the... I'm going to say fixtures inside the property, like the blinds and the and those sort of things. Mm, that's right. So, um, gas heaters. Yes, exactly. All of these items. I mean, the gas heater caused some particular problems, um, but they yeah. were fighting over blinds and Venetian blinds and curtains and just goodness knows what they weren't fighting over. They were obviously um, bosom buddies with each other. These two brothers. Um, <laughs> but this is. I mean, this is an interesting thing in property law that that it's. You know, when there are relational breakdowns, whether they be business, familial or, or friends, and, and they've done, gone into deals and transactions and acquired property together or shared interests in various ways, and then the relationship breaks down, dealing with the property law consequences and fallout can often be, you know, um, very protracted and, and also, you know, interesting. But if we have a look at some of those examples, what would you say, for example, you know, without necessarily going to the Prolumbri case itself just a minute, but um, what would you say about um, Venetian blinds in terms of thinking about it as a fixture or as item of personal property? I'd consider them a fixture. Yeah, I need to know why. I don't need to just tell me. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, okay. Any justification? Uh, no, that's all right. <laughs> okay. Um, Venetian go, back the, go back to the tests, right? Go back to the tests. Yep. No, I'm, I'm going back to it. Venetian blinds are, well, the purpose of Venetian blinds are to block out sun mm. and to create some sort of shade or privacy mm. in the house. Mm. But how are, they, how are they attached? That's the thing. How are they attached? Well, well Venetian blinds are typically screwed to the, the frame of the window. Yeah, that's right. So they're not. They're not just hanging on their own weight. They're, they're actually permanently attached. Are they hard to remove? To remove them would cause some damage, yes. Uh, not actually. You can actually remove them to clean them. but um, and You can remove them to clean them, but yeah. to completely remove the yeah, Venetian right. blinds with yeah. their yeah. brackets and frames, you would end up leaving holes in the frame. Yeah, that's right. Um, so those sort of, that's the sort of you know, detail of investigation that needs to be looked at. Um, and also at the time when, you know, if you're looking at a property that was purchased and uh, 
things were added to it. So at the time when it was purchased, it was, pur was it purchased with these Venetians or were they subsequently added? Were they attached in such a way that it was clear that they were meant to be removed and not left there permanently? So we've got Venetian. What about blind? What about curtains? How would you how would you categorise curtains against the tests? Curtains could possibly be classified as personal property or chattel because they can be. They thinking very generically here. Curtains sit on a on a rail, mm. um, and the curtain themselves can slide off the rail and can be removed. But the rail itself is fixed. Yeah, yeah. But so, and and of course, for, you know, in a contract, and I'll just just move across to something a bit more practical at the moment. Um, in contracts for the sale of land, you can add various items, you know, into the standard form for a contract of sale. And very often, there's a reference to furnish fur, furnishings and furbishings and, and this sort of nature to include such matters. But um, as well, it is true that uh, something like curtains is very, very particular of taste to, to the Ooh. occupant, uh, whether it be um, a tenant or whether it be an owner. And um, that sort of len lead, lends itself a bit more to the idea that it's not intended to be there permanently or for, you know, to, to form part of the actual dwelling itself. But it's, it's very much about the... Um, the decor or the, the, the sense of how the, taste yeah, yeah, to decorate um, for, what, for the period that they are in occupation, right, as owner or as maybe as tenant, for example. We just go to the Plumbury case and um, if just look at page 11 there of my notes. After referring to the tests established for determining if an item is a fixture, the judge commented, there has been a perceptible decline in the comparative importance of the degree or mode of annexation with a tendency to greater emphasis being placed upon the intention with which the item is placed upon the land. This shift involved a greater reliance upon the individual surrounding circumstances. One of the things to remember and bear in mind in this area is that I think it's just, it seems sometimes deceptively straightforward to take these tests of degree and purpose of annexation, apply them to what are essentially things in the nature of what was tossed up in the Plumbury case inside a dwelling or maybe some items outside a dwelling. Um, but there, there has been a bit of waxing and waning in terms of where the emphasis is. And the second thing is that it's really not actually all that straightforward at the end of the day. It really much, very much depends on the surrounding circumstances. It very much depends on the particular facts it very much depends on how we identify the intention of the person or the entity and affixing in the first place and what was, what was that intention with regard to these items. What about um, something like a dishwasher? Um, a dishwasher, the way a dishwasher is, is attached is is very much permanent. It's not something that is intended to be um, temporary. It's got hard wiring. It's got hard plumbing. You can have you can have dishwashers that are actually installed, if you like, into the cupboards cupboard space area of a kitchen. Yeah. You can yeah. also have movable um, dishwashers, can't you? Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I think you can. Yeah. Okay. Um, so again, you need to look at the, the particular circumstances, but you're quite right about dishwashers. They're a bit different, and I, I toss it up deliberately, um, because it requires them to be attached not only to the water service, both hot and cold water service, but it also requires electricity connection. And in fact, you have to have a specially licensed plumber to come and do the work, you know, assuming you're not going to do it yourself, um, that has that license to actually deal with both electrics and water. Um, rather than just one who doesn't. What about uh, a stove? A stove, again, very similar to a dishwasher. It is a very, it, on face value, looking at it, it's a, it's a permanent part of the kitchen. But without the stove in the kitchen, yeah. would it still be called a kitchen? 
So if you purchased a dwelling and you went in and you went looked through it, you know, you look at these programs, for example, with renovations and all that sort of jazz, and imagine if the seller who, who uh, paid $1.5 million on Sydney property prices then came back in and found that the um, milieu or whatever that French or the German, uh, um, you know, high price stoves are, um, had been taken out and there was a big hole in the wall in the kitchen. Um, I dare say they wouldn't be very impressed, would they? No. They would uh, make an assumption. It may well have been specified in the contract, which would be good, but they certainly, whether it was there or not, um, make an assumption that <laughs> part of what they were buying. They were not going to buy a kitchen with a big hole in the wall. They had to fill in their own stove. So the stove is historically considered to be, um, you know, a fixture really, much more a fixture, um, than some other types of items that you might find within dwellings. Let's uh, move outside a dwelling space again and let's think about a different type of structure. What about um, a structure that, uh, you know, we might describe as a demountable? Ooh, good one. Good one. Demountables. As an engineer, I, 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 you probably, were, you know, well acquainted with this idea. Yeah. Yeah, m most of my lectures are spent in a demountable. Uh, that's my site office. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay, and okay. It is, and, and because of that, um, a demountable is not really considered, uh, uh, well, I, I would form the view that it's not considered a fixture mm. because the type of structure it is is temporary. Mm. Um, the type of material that it's made out of is is not, I guess, uh, long-lasting or intended to be something which which endures. How is how is the? Are you sitting in? Are you sitting in a demountable at the moment? No, no, no. I'm in my my lounge. Oh, I'm yeah, in the okay. most boring part of which is, boring part of my house. Which is which is not a which is not a demountable. <laughs> no, no, no. Not, thank God. Um, but. Uh, Normally, in your experience of demountables, how are they affixed to the land surface? They're on some sort of concrete plinth or block. Just to, they're just rested. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're, they're not on. They're on a temporary footing, just to make them level. So it. basically, when you're in one of these demountables on one of your work sites, mm. if it's not a fixture, then basically the person that owns it could come along and remove it at any time. Is that right? Including when you're inside it. That. That's well. They wouldn't take it when I'm inside it because there'd be WHS problems. But it, it is certainly their right to come on site. I mean, we hire our demountables from from Coates or someone else, mm. and it's it's basically leased to us for yeah. a period of time. Yeah. And they do bring it on a crane or on the back of a tilt tray, and mm. it's plonked where we tell them to put it, and that's it. Mm. When it's when the job's finished, they come and collect it. Yeah. No, we don't have any rights over it. We only have a right over it while we while we're, it's under lease. Well, you have you have rights as a lessee, That's um, right. but you don't have ownership uh, rights. No, don't have ownership. No. What about if we just change the scenario a little bit? Um, and um, what about demountables in public schools? Because sometimes a demountable, for example, in a public school, um, can be there for twenty or thirty years because there is yeah. no funds to build any more secure structure. Correct. Um, takes me back to my primary school now and the demountables that I went to school in are still there. Yeah. But the purpose of those was to be a, a lightweight, low cost building to house students. And from the outset, it wasn't intended as a permanent structure, as a temporary structure, sorry. It's intended as a long term classroom. Right. So, so demountable may be just a characteristic of it, but it, it is a classroom. Right. So in determining whether an item is a, a fixture, we don't focus obsessively on the item itself. We don't exclude a consideration of the nature of the item, but we go back to the intention. Well, of intention... Course, the idea of annexation requires us to look at both the purpose of any, the purpose of annexation and uh, uh, the, degree the degree in terms of trying to determine whether or not the, that establishes what's necessary for this per item of personal property 
to then be considered to be a fixture. But wouldn't the Palumbri case lend itself more to the demountable example because it would it involves a greater reliance upon the individual surrounding circumstances? Well, this is a good point. And um, this is actually one of the things that I, I sort of toss out there is that are, is Blacker's case and Palumbri's case, do they sit easily together or are they actually suggesting different emphasis? I, I think the two need to be read together. They're, I don't think they can be... What, I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. They both give um, insight into how to look at, a, how to look at, at something, as, as whether it's a fixture or chattel. And I think depending on the item, so looking at the demountable, um, Palumbri's lends itself quite well because we look at the circumstances as to, as to why, it, why, how and when. And looking at the fountain, um, black is, um, is, lends itself nicely because it talks mm. about um, the, the purpose and the degree yeah. um, of annexation. But if we then use your scenario, the curveball you throw me about the, the owner who's an avid bird watcher, um, Palumbri as a, as, a, as a segue into Blacker mm. clarifies Hmm. Um, what it is, in fact. So it, in that scenario, it might actually shift from being a fixture to chattel because the circumstances around why Birdwatcher Man put it there yep, yep. defines the purpose of annexation. Yep. So, and then et cetera, et cetera. So. Now that's, um, that's very good, uh, Samuel. But um, one thing I just wanted, and that, that process of reasoning you've adopted there is, is good. Uh, I just want to um, put you within a more practical legal frame, I suppose. Um, imagine that you are representing a client, and I know that you're in New South Wales, or you're actually, I think you're in Sydney, aren't you? Um, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So imagine you're representing a client before, the, before and this matter went to before a, a court in New South Wales. What case law would you think would be um, more favoured in the New South Wales court? Now, this requires you, of course, to think about the doctrine of precedent a little bit and the authoritative nature of the case law that you've been referring to. A New South Wales case would be uh, obviously preferable. Um, Unless we have High Court authority. Um, Unless we have High Court authority, yes. We don't, got... we don't actually have any High Court authority on this point. Um, the cases we've looked at, so Palumbri's case, where is that from? New South Wales. Right. Equity. New South Wales Court, or the Supreme Court. Um, yeah. Blacker's case, what, what jurisdiction? It's Federal Court. Federal Court. Federal that's, influ court. that's influential, of course. Yes. But jurisdictional differences. But, what, but even Blacker's case relied on what case? Or, or it relied on the Australian Provincial Assurance case. Where's that from? That's New South Wales exactly. as well. So there's a strong body of case law really emerging here from the New South Wales jurisdiction, which would justify New South Wales court tending in that direction. And the other thing that I point this out in the notes on page 11, the Plumbridge case was followed by, um, uh, well, what's yeah, the Eon, Eon Medals? Yeah, yeah, essentially a Western Australian decision. Um, or involving, involving, you know, the Commission of Tax in Western Australia. Um, so there's a strong sort of emphasis there in terms of that body of law in New South Wales. Now, what you said earlier, that's fine, and that's, you know, the logic you've used there and the analysis, that's good. Um, it also, I think, is sometimes important to remember the, the structural features of, of how you use the law to present an argument, um, given, you know, particular jurisdictional factors as well and what law might be more influential um, to different courts and so on and so forth. Um, if we go back to, we're on about 8.30, so we, we want to finish off this um, just in a minute. But if we go back to the question, problem 21. So, we, you know, we've dealt with the tests. We've dealt with how, we, how it works. Um, the idea of uh, fixing. What about the original, per the original, uh, or the rationale for the doctrine, 
and this idea of linking to the, the, the goal of conservation of community services, uh, a community, sorry, community resourcing uh, and preventing waste, the, the wasteful dis dismantling of objects. How does that sort of, that background rationale fit into how we're trying to use it, you know, in the Palumbury case, for example? Palumbury asks us to look at the individual circumstances. Mm, mm. Um, going back to community resources and wasteful processes of dismantling objects affixed to land. In other words, it's asking us to, to go back and, re and think about the rationale for where the doctrine came from originally. Was the, was the doctrine created to deal with fact situations like in Palumbri, fights over curtains, Venetians, stoves, dishwashers? Was that what it was, was, that what it was originally, how it originally evolved for, to deal with? Well, this is, you know, facts to, fact situations to deal with, or was it came out of something else? No, it came out of something else. Because what you have to think about is if you go back into the history of land ownership, right, particularly in England, which of course is where historically we draw our antecedents from, who owned the land? The Crown. Uh, As the ultimate owner. Well, yes, but um, remember the, the feudal system, right? And you have oh, yes. this, this, this coven feud nation, this system... Of, of links between the overlord and the, the chief tenant and the chief tenant and all that. So basically, you know, there's this idea that things were put, put in as part of the land, um, as part of what was the, the land, if you like. And if you were allowed when, when there was a change in hands of ownership of these things or, um, uh, those that, that, that had rights with respect and to every time that happened to basically take everything away that wasn't it wasn't the actual dwelling or whatever on the land um, this would have created a lot of upheaval you know in, in in how land was actually used okay so there is a you know an historical um, uh, rationale there which I think is fair to argue is a bit different to the way that um, the doctrine is applied in the circumstances of how we live and function today. Um, it doesn't mean, I don't think, necessarily that the doctrine is irrelevant, even though there's been some doubts about its continuing utility, but it just comes out of a different background, okay? That's, that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to throw in just before we finish this is an example. We've spoken about the demountables, all right? Um, in some parts of Australia, historically, not so much anymore, but actually, you know, we're both in New South Wales, but particularly in Queensland, and this is a Queensland uh, source, sourced program, um, it was not uncommon, for example, to see houses or half of houses going down the, the freeway, going down the highway, because basically houses were built on stilts um, and on structures to, to you know, um, to overcome issues about flooding and stuff like that. Yeah. And the truth of the matter was is that the dwelling could actually be put on the back of a, a flat top and taken down the road, uh, often cut in half and then put back together again when, um, when they got to the destination. You can even see this, for example, in the modern period, not you know, so much these days in Queensland, but I don't know if you've ever seen on SBS a program called Monster Moves. Yeah, I've seen it. Uh, yeah, and sometimes that's exactly what they do. I saw one the other day where, for example, they took a huge church and they, they shifted it from one part of the state to the other part. So if that can be done, surely that raises the question of whether or not even the dwelling is intended to be a fixture. Uh, look, you'd, you'd have to go back to... You'd have to go back to your tests and... You'd have to you'd have to go back to how did that dwelling come into being on the land to start off with? How does a dwelling? You can't just pick up a dwelling and put it on a piece of land without there being some intention of it being permanent. 
because it does need utilities, it does need services. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. It needs planning, consent, and yes, uh, yes, and, and all that sort of stuff. But there'd be enough of a background legal argument to create a rational, um, a rational logic behind the degree of annexation and the object of annexation. Mm. Why is it there? Mm. Not, that's, not there for the weekend. Yeah, that's true. And of course, um, today, uh, even uh, where we have dwellings that are not actually on a cement slab, which as you know, from your engineering perspective, many today are on cement slabs, whilst historically they were not. Um, yeah. So whether on a slab, obviously you can't do that. What, what, I, what I was just talking about previously. Um, but today, when someone purchases land, uh, say, you know, in a residential context in particular, they, you know, they are purchasing the land and the dwelling on top of the land, um, even though, in truth, in Sydney today, <laughs> mostly probably what they're buying is the land. And, uh, you know, I have an instance, for example, uh, not too far from, from where I lived for a, several years, where we had an interesting scenario where um, a person at the time when I was living in, in a house there, the, um, the house that I owned, the about few few houses along, there was a, um, a fibro house, and as you know, in some parts of Sydney, fibro was de rigueur in terms of some of the outer developments, whatever. Uh, yeah. well, at the time, outer developments are probably more inner now. Um, and uh, this particular dwelling, the the then owner spent about, I think, sixty. I oh know he spent a hundred thousand dollars on the dwelling. Um, you know, renovating, extending it a little bit. Um, landscaping, uh, various things, whatever, but it was still the fibro dwelling. Right? That dwelling was then purchased by new, uh, by purchasers, you know, a um, new couple came in and uh, they lived in the dwelling for about uh, six months and then they levelled the block. So he'd spent $100,000 on the dwelling and then they levelled it. They went away for nine months and built a new two-storey brick structure on the dwelling and then move back in again. So one question for me as a property lawyer is when they purchased, what were they actually purchasing? What was of more value to them? The land, their perceived value of the land. Mm. But of course, when they purchased the property, I'm sure the contract of sale spoke about the land and including the dwelling sitting on the land. Mm. But, and this raises interesting points, you know, today, of course, with um, property prices in a place like Sydney, when what we've been discussing in this course, what you are, what are you actually purchasing? Because imagine if in that case, those purchases had done that and then subsequently the state government came along and said, we're now resuming your land because we want to build a freeway through the property. And we're going to, knock all, we're going to level your dwelling <laughs> because we're going to build a freeway through it. So there you go. It's interesting. Um, all right, so let's move on from problem 21 to problem 22. Um, now, I have given you the Ricardo case there, which is a very recent decision of the United Kingdom Supreme Court um, for a couple of reasons. One is that it's nice to have an example of a decision that's relevant to what we're talking about from the UK Supreme Court, which actually um, is now the highest court of appeal in the UK uh, judicial pyramid uh, and replaced the House of Lords, which I'm sure you're aware of. Um, it was created in 2009. And I actually put a small YouTube clip on the um, uh, website about the UK Supreme Court. Um, so it's nice to have that, I think, um, to just bring to your attention um, this court um, as being the, the now the highest court in, in the English judicial pyramid. But um, in particular, the Ricardo case um, in the UK Supreme Court comes up with this statement, the rights of the owner of the surface land to the strata beneath it stops at the point at which physical features such as pressure and temperature render the concept of the strata belonging to anybody so absurd, so absurd as to be not worth worrying about. Comment on the appropriateness of, uh, appropriateness of this approach in the Australian context, including in relation to mineral deposits. Do you want to have a go at this one? Um, I 
maybe maybe start firstly with the statement from Ricardo, and then we'll move on to the application. Okay. What do you think about the uh, Supreme Court's statement in Ricardo? I think it's a bit subjective because who determines the concept of whether the temperature and pressure at a certain point in the strata, and this is, we're now talking about subsoil here and subsurface, mm. um, is absurd to not worry about. Mm. If, you, if, you, if you, again, that depends on the owner and what their, their view of what is important to them and what they want to gain out of this land. It's kind of, it's got a mining sort of um, flavour to it. Mm. or an extractive sort of property. Um, sorry, property, I don't mean property as in property, but I mean it's got an ex extractive um, characteristic to it. Mm, mm, uh, mm. The question, of course, that's begged by Bricardo's, the statement there from Bricardo is how far into the subsoil should the landowner's rights extend? It's basically saying that when it's absurd and not, not worrying about hmm. the, at the point in which physical features such as pressure and temperature into the concept of the strata belonging to anybody so absurd. Hmm. So is that 10 metres? Is that 100 metres? Is that 1,000 metres? Is that the centre of the earth? Hmm. See, this again takes us back to this tension between the objective and the subjective. You've pointed out correctly, I think, fair to say that um, there's, a, there's a clear subjective aspect to what is being said here in this formulation. Um, how do you, how does one determine these things? To a degree, of course. The, again, we go back to the idea of the particular circumstances of the case. Um, if we go back to the notes, for example, on page fifteen, where I discuss Ricardo's case. Following that, um, the point is made there that, that basically what the judges are saying is that this reinforces the the, the earlier decisions uh, in relation to ownership of soil um, or subsoil rather, um, which emphasise that the surface landowner could assert title in relation to subsoil within effective control. Hmm. But but there's a subjective aspect to that as well. I mean, what is effective control? You know, and 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 uh, how far does one exert effective control? I suppose ultimately, and we need to, we'll deal with minerals separately in a moment. But in terms of having effective control, it goes back to your point earlier when we were looking at um, the idea of the doctrine of fixtures. For the purposes of utility and amenity and use of the land, right, what does that mean in terms of effective control? And these are interlinked questions, not you know, the doctrine of fixtures idea, but those, those things that you're looking at are interlinked in my view. So, for example, it will make a difference whether or not the land is used for agricultural purposes as opposed to residential accommodation pur purposes. Yeah, correct. Like you're yes. just living on the land for accommodation purposes, like in suburbia or whatever. Um, even but in suburbia, you can still have gardens and you can have you know maybe orchard trees at the back, depending on the size of your land or whatever um, and background. Um, but that will certainly be the the land will be used in a different way than if you're um, you know you're a farm and 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 you're involved in agriculture and you have to actually physically dig into the ground to do whatever it is you do in your agricultural business, right? farming of the land and so forth. So that will make a difference. How far down do, do, does that go in terms of effective control? You know, there isn't, again, one answer to this. It depends on the circumstances, but these are the things that we look to. The idea of effective control, um, the idea of... Um, well, going so far beneath the surface that it becomes ridiculous and it's, it's 
you know, a nonsense to talk about having control. So <clears throat> if you were talking about, you know, the landowner of a block of land in um, suburbia, Australia, wanting to have control of the land for a thousand feet or a thousand metres beneath the surface of their land, then, you know, this raises a whole lot of issues. The other, the other problem, of course, too, is that what, what and, we, and again, I'm not even dealing with minerals at the moment, I will shortly, what else is under the land? Utilities. The utilities. Hmm. And does the landowner have any rights with respect to the utilities? With respect to some utilities, yes. Example? Their house, uh, their telecommunications, their power, their water hmm. service, their drainage. But they don't own the utilities, do they? They they own <laughs> they they do they they own a portion of what is servicing their building, not the utility itself. So there's a there might be a, a, a sewer main running in the front of my property hmm. on my land. Hmm. However, I don't own the sewer main, but I own from the junction back to my house. That you, is own, my you own you you own the the, the, I own the land surface. But the utility provider, and will when you when you study the, when we do land law next term, and I hope mm. you're going to do land law next term with me. <laughs> you will. Um, you I'll be will, fighting tooth and nail. <laughs> <laughs> you you will discover that the utility provider actually has something called an easement over that area that contains the utility device. So. Yeah. I'm not disagreeing with that. They, yeah, they yeah. have an easement over their property. Yeah. But no, over from, the item, over the item the that land. they have the responsibility to maintain. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But, what, from, but my connection to them is mine. Oh, yes, that's right, that's right. But then, that's of course, right. it gets into interesting questions about who, whose responsibility is it to maintain which part of the connection. And then, for example, you get into interesting scenarios, for example, water supply coming from the mains water, right, and who has responsibility for which part of the junction and which part of the whatever. I mean, I remember even in my own practical experience having interesting debates with Sydney Water and others about, you know, is it on this side of the, the, the junction the connector? Yeah. Is it on that side of the junction connector? So it gets to, to that degree of detail. So um, trying to sort all this out, and, of course, utilities running under the land surface can include things like not only water supply they can and drainage, uh, and sewerage, but they can include potentially mains water. You can have a mains running under your land, which is not necessarily related to you. It could be a sewer running under your land, which you could have you know, access into. Uh, there could be a storm water drain, a whole lot of things, telecommunications. So there's all of this stuff going on, particularly um, with respect to um, in the residential areas. But in any, any area where there's accommodation, even, you know, in regional and so forth, there's, there's utilities like that. And these are part of modern living. Um, historically, that wasn't the case, but they're there today and they have to be, we have to somehow accommodate these interests. Um, and then, of course, um, we have the other issue of the question refers um, in the application part Problem question 22, it says, comment on the appropriateness of this approach in the Australian context, and, of course, that's partly anticipating, you know, the modern modern um, use of land and so forth and the utilities as a part of that, that scenario, including in relation to mineral deposits. So what's the response with regard to mineral deposits? And do we deal with different types of deposits differently? We, we do deal with different mineral deposits differently. <laughs> That's uh, well put. <laughs> um, I think it depends on the, the value or what, what is perceived as, as a valuable mineral. Uh, yeah. Petroleum and crude oil, yes. Yeah. Um, shale and sandstone, no. What about precious metals? Am I thinking of any in particular? <laughs> Gold. And? Silver. Yes, that's right. So, look, basically, we've got two situations here. We've got some, let's deal with the, the historical ones first, right? So the common law 
basically dealt with the situation of gold and silver. So in Woolley's case, which is an early English decision, you can see there going back to look at the notes um, that um, gold and silver um, was was historically um, a preserve a prerogative right of the crown, and they did not pass to the landowner. One of the reasons for that, of course, is that gold and silver were means of exchange, um, yeah. and you know when when systems of currency were against the gold standard and things of that nature. But these particular types of precious metals have always been, you know, of that nature really and, of, and continuingly. But what's interesting is that, and I make the point there at the um, top of page 17 of the notes, that um, this goes back to a very early um, 16th century case and should that still be justified today without any question? You know, we can ask that question open in an open way. And when we talk about precious metals, you know, why gold and silver only? What about diamonds? What about other types of precious metals? And there's a whole range of potential precious metals and even gemstones that one could consider. I mean, imagine if you own a property, for example, at Cooper Pedy or at Lightning Ridge. Mm. The place is full of precious metals, which are highly valuable. Um, so there's, you know, particular issues there. Um, other types of what I've referred to as mineral deposits, trying to use the best descriptors I could, um, and, I, you know, in the early, at the beginning of the class, I, I said that these deposits can be solid, liquid or gaseous. Um, so we then had the intervention of Parliament because of how these deposits are used for basically energy. So we've got the Mineral Resources Act, and, of course, some of this legislation is state-based, some is Commonwealth. So in Queensland, of course, we need to refer to the Queensland legislation, um, but it's, it's cognate legislation in other jurisdictions. So the Mineral Resources Act in Queensland, the Petroleum Act in Queensland, and then more latterly the, um, the Atomic Energy Act, which is a Commonwealth legislation, with regard to uranium, uh, as you can imagine, and, and things of that nature. Although the Commonwealth seems to have more interesting things to worry about these days than uranium. <laughs> <laughs> post post budget 2014 doesn't yeah um, uh, I just actually I was looking at the, on the news tonight just as a little side issue and whether you saw but all the protests students protesting all around the country today and what I thought to myself is I wonder if all what what are online students doing are they protesting as well and and what method of protest are they going to use when they were they're only an online student they can't obviously make the sort of the physical presence that students marching down streets can. But on the other hand, they don't really have the same problems with security and policing authorities either because through online sites, they can do things that, you know, that marching down streets doesn't cause the same sort of issues. Um, but, you know, those issues are issues for all students. They're not just issues for those students that were, in, you know, marching down the streets of Sydney and Melbourne and other cities today. But then none of your students, Michael, because we're all busy studying for the exam next week. <laughs> Well, well played, sir. Very well played. <laughs> but I'm sure it's something that's in the background of um, all students' minds um, with regard to uncapping of fees and so forth. Um, you know, and particularly professional programs because they're the ones that will attract, as everyone everyone knows, will attract higher higher fees. Universities will see these as ways of bringing revenue into the universities and so on and so forth. Anyway, that's a separate issue. Um, so. Um, we have the, the, those uh, sources of law with regard to the regulation of mineral deposits found in legislation uh, and also found in the general law. Uh, and historically through the general law, common law, there were certain types of mineral deposits that were preserved to the Crown as part of the prerogative rights of the Crown. Um, probably if you're linked into the constitutional law class, there's probably some discussion about prerogative rights of the Crown there as well, so there's some degree of overlap between yeah. <laughs> these two causes. Uh, so, you know, that really then addresses that second part of the application of the um, approach in Ricardo to both the Australian context and also the situation containing or involving mineral deposits. It's yet another illustration of the limited nature of the rights actually that a landowner has. Um, and those rights are limited in so many ways, but 
the truth of the matter is that the society that we inhabit and live in today, it still commands the greatest form of security with regard to accommodation and with regard to um, uh, financial structure as well, getting access to finance and so forth in terms of the way things have been set up. Um, all right, I just want to go back to, because there wasn't a question on this, but I'll just refer to it, and that is the issue about airspace, um, which is an important one. Uh, and, you know, the lead case there, which I've, you know, it's been around for quite a while, the Bernstein and Skyviews case, most of the books, including the reference in the case book, give a fairly um, compacted view about the historical circumstances in which the Skyviews case came about. That's why I gave you the longer version of the facts taken from the uh, Bally website. Um, you know, it's just interesting. And basically, you know, what was going on here was that you had an English aristocrat, a lord, complaining about the invasion of his his estate, basically, in, in um, rural England. And... Um, but the invasion was, <laughs> in quotes, invasion, um, was, was basically a strategy that was being adopted to try and convince people to, to you know, get involved in, in buying or selling land. That's the truth of the matter. Um, and the, you know, the issue was surrounded to, you know, in terms of what actually transpired in the case, the overflight aircraft, the taking of a photograph, you know, could he own all of this airspace so that nothing could violate it, you know? And, 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 that, and he went back to this old Latin maxim from the 13th century that um, I own everything basically to the heavens, right? Um, well, the court, uh, um, the English High Court of Justice dealt with that in fairly short shrift um, and I thought the, the reference to Lord Wilberforce in Commissioner of Railways and Valuer General was very interesting. Um, of course, Lord Wilberforce, famous judge, and a very, had a very acerbic <laughs> way of expressing, his, expressing himself at times. He was actually a, little, a very, very, very little short man, um, with a bit of a squeaky voice, but um, uh, an excellent judicial and legal mind. And, and in this case, he said that it was unlikely that such a sweeping, unscientific and unpractical doctrine as that land meant the whole of the space from the centre of the earth to the heavens would appeal to the common law mind. If the Latin maxim were applied literally, it would lead to the absurdity of trespass being committed every time a satellite passed over a suburban garden. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. And so, again, we're, we're taken back to the thought and the idea that the court has to always try and strike a balance between competing interests and com intentions. And in trying to work out what sort of claims or rights over airspace a landowner has, that's exactly what um, they're doing in the Bernstein case. The problem in this case, is the, as the judgment goes on, the problem in this case was to balance the rights of a landowner to enjoy the use of the land, you know, back to this idea of the use of the land, mm. against the rights of the general public to take advantage of all that science now offered in the use of airspace. The best way to strike a balance in our present society was to restrict the rights of the owner in the airspace above his land to such height as was necessary for the ordinary use and enjoyment of his land and the structures upon it. And that is abundantly sensible and logical. And it interestingly takes us back to a tension which we raised right back at the beginning of the course between the yeah. public and the private. <coughs> mm. Gabriel, uh, so Samuel, you had a point? Uh, I was just going to say, it, it kind of um, goes back to, I'm just trying to find the case. Um, I've got it in my notes. It's... Uh, where is that case? Where is that case? It is the... Is it the Victoria Park case? In relation to what? Where the, the other chap um, erected a, like a scaffold or, and a structure on a five metre high platform on scaffold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People yeah. could see. Yeah, it's and a Victoria uh, Park racing. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Just to, to see the, the, the uh, horse race. To see the horse race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know it's, it's kind of got to do with whether an, a spectacle can be owned or not, but mm. um, 
in the context of, of airspace. But it takes us also back to the ideas of nuisance and trespass as well, which were raised in that case and were, were, were raised in, in the Bernstein case. Because what's interesting here is that, again, this takes us back to a theme raised early in the course in terms of how property owners will seek to protect their rights using general law as opposed to legislation. Right? And the way that they do that is by saying their rights have been violated by the commission of a trespass or by the creation of a nuisance. But as we know, the ideas of trespass and nuisance are not property law notions. They are what? Tort. Exactly. So here again, a point that was raised in last week's class about whether we should view property law, or in my view, any area of the law, but, you know, my concern is property law, whether we should view it narrowly and clinically in terms of property law notions or whether we necessarily need to be more expansive and, and break down the compartmentalizations that have, a, have you know, um, derived from the past and see really what we are concerned more about is trying to get a balance between rights and obligations, between persons or entities that come into conflict with each other and what is the right balance to be struck. And the response to that is not one universal response but it is informed by the varying situations, the varying circumstances, the varying conditions in which that is to take place. You know, are we talking about, for example, a problem or an issue occurring on private land and trying to strike the balance in that situation? Are we talking about something occurring on a public space, We're trying to get a balance between private rights and public use of public space. Are we, as we've seen historically in, you know, in, the, in this course up until now, um, what about circumstances of Crown land? Remember some of the cases involving national parks and the right of private citizens? What were those rights? Um, you know, there's, there's, so as we're getting towards the culmination here, we can also see these earlier themes continuing to resonate. And, and, uh, so that's just something to, to bear in mind uh, as we, we shift our mind towards that final, that final assessment task. Um, we're, we're looking for things that, are, that interlink and, and where the overlaps are uh, and that we're not rigidly compartmentalising into these topics, but what are the over, what, how do the, the various topics link into each other? How do the themes link in? What are the, what are the broader overarching ideas and ideals that underpin property law and our understanding of property law. So, um, basically, um, that's, that's where we are in terms of topic 10. What I might ask you to do um, is, you know, in a normal way, um, just um, you can write down what three takeaway points that uh, you've gleaned from uh, this session this evening. And uh, I'll give you a few moments just to think about it and maybe write them down and then maybe share one or two of them if you're able to do so. Okay. The three, three points that you take away from this class this evening. Okay. That's that one. You've got some background noise going on there. Sorry, yes. I'll uh, maybe just mute it until you actually decide to. Yes, sure. Okay, yeah, because it's on the recording, that's all. <laughs> I 
It's fine. All good now? Yeah, that's fine. Look, I, it's challenging okay. sometimes, Samuel. I, I mean, I have I have kids around me and uh, issues going on in the background and some whatever, you know, it's just, it's again a balancing act, isn't it? <laughs> it <laughs> we is. go back to that point, don't we? Yeah. Mm. So have you got, um, what would be a takeaway point or a couple for you? I think the, the main thing that comes out for me is um, for something to be a fixture or to consider something a fixture, I need to, there's an objective test which needs to be applied but has a somewhat subjective underlying tone to it as per plumbery. Mm. And um, depending on the jurisdiction, um, I'd need to consider which case law I need to apply to that and see which is going to be more persuasive to help give my client the right advice or to obtain a certain outcome. And does th- thanks for that. And and t- does the realization that law in the end sort of works between the objective and the subjective? Does that does that does that cause you to be unsettled or cause you concern, or do you have some other sort of response? To- oh, it, it doesn't cause me to be unsettled. I think it helps me clarify how to form an answer to the question of law in front of me, mm. whether whether I'm trying to determine whether a demountable is a fixture or a chattel mm. or if it's, uh, if, it's, if it's fixed or if it's not fixed, if it's what's its intention, what's its purpose. Mm. It does float between the objective and the subjective. But in going through that, that, that cycle, you probably arrive to a more closer answer to what it is as opposed to going well, it's concreted, it's fixed, it's a fixture. Exactly. It still may, not be a, still may not be a fixture. It may not be, and the court at the end of the day may take a different view. One of the things mm. that I'm very um, firmly of the view of, and I'm sure this has come through in, in all of my materials and my classes, that law and legal problem solving and advising clients and working as a lawyer and even, you know, working through the process of your, your, your studies as being a student, it's not a mechanical exercise. Law is not a, a mathematical problem to which there is this perfect solution waiting to be discovered, um, like that wonderful, you know, um, mathematical theorem that was discovered recently, you know, in the last few years and hadn't been discovered for centuries or something, and it helped to solve all these problems. Whatever. It's doesn't work quite like that. Um, even though we have this, this array of rules and principles, the, the exercise of how law functions is not um, a mathematical mind game. Um, with, 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 and, and that's actually what makes the exercise, in my view, more interesting. But for some, it makes it more challenging and it makes it less certain and it's partly that that explains the reach of law as well because it then moves beyond that, that matrix of rules and principles, as we've seen in this course, into the broader landscape of social, political, moral and societal contexts and conditions in which these rules and principles emerge to help shape how we are, how we can cohabit, how we can use things um, and so on and so forth. Yes. There we are, sir. Topic ten, done and dusted. <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for joining, um, and um, we'll be covering just for for the purposes of the recording and also for yourself. We'll be covering topic eleven on Friday in the regular regular time slot, which is the last topic. Um, it's the class from eleven to twelve thirty uh, eleven a.m. to twelve thirty p.m. on Friday this week, week twelve. And then on Monday, at this time, this same time slot, that's Monday of week 13 from 7.30pm to 9pm, I'll be doing the exam preparation class for anyone that wants to come along. And it'll be recorded too, so. Oh, that's good. Okay. I, I have a constitutional law moot on Monday night. Ooh, at that time, I'm sure. <laughs> at 7pm. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you can't miss that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm, in the, I'm, I'm in the moot. 
it's, uh, right. this is my assessment task. Okay, okay, good. So. I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be, one of the assessment items in land law will be a moot. And uh, I'm just, uh, not yet, but I'll give some thought as to how I'm going to structure that in terms of teams of students and so forth so that everyone can get involved in it in various ways. Um, but it's, yeah, interesting exercise. I'll be interested to hear your feedback on, um, if you're happy to share it, on your experience. Have you, have you, have you been involved, one, in, involved in one already in the program? Uh, no, I haven't. This will be my first uh, moot. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, have, I have been to court before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> that's a different story, yeah, yeah. 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 That's fine. Okay, that's good. All right, okay. Um, thanks, uh, Samuel, for joining, and um, bye for now. Thank you, Mark. Have a good night. You too.